we've talked about computing a hash from digital data. This creates a fingerprint of the data and it's used for, keeping the for checking the integrity of the data. We've also talked about symmetric keys. Uh, symmetric keys are when you want to keep the data itself secret. You use that symmetric key in order, like a, like a password, but more technically correct, it's called the cryptographic key. We use that key to encrypt data, and then we use the same key to decrypt data. And the reason why we wanted to do that is because we want to send our encrypted data over the public internet, not be afraid that someone who can intercept it is going to be able to get that data and read it, and yet we need the person on the other side, our recipient, to be able to see the original data, and so they'll decrypt it. Now, the symmetric key algorithm solved the problem of being able to move the data across the internet in a way that it wouldn't be intercepted and be able to be read, but it created this new problem, and that problem is, how do I get the key that we use to encrypt the data to the recipient who's going to need the key in order to decrypt the data? If we're going to try and send it across the internet, we have the same problem that we had with the data in the first place, that we're going to have to send something across the public internet, and if that, gets, if that key gets intercepted, then the data that gets sent next, whether it's encrypted or not, can be read by um, Dr. Evil in the middle. So that was a big motivation for creating asymmetric keys. Asymmetric keys are different. Rather than using the same key, in order to encrypt and decrypt the data, now we're going to use two keys. One key is going to be able to encrypt the data, and another key is going to be used to decrypt the data. These keys, uh, unlike symmetric keys, which a symmetric key itself can be kind of any phrase that you choose, it can be a passphrase, it can be um, something that's secure but that you choose. Unlike a symmetric key, Asymmetric keys have to be mathematically linked. There's a relationship between the two keys that enables them to be used for encryption and decryption, and therefore you can't just choose them, they have to be generated. So symmetric keys use the same key to encrypt data and decrypt data. Asymmetric keys, one is used to encrypt and one is used to decrypt. Now it turns out that you can use either key for either role, and that's one of the features of asymmetric cryptography is that you can use uh, the keys interchangeably. So what this enables us to do now in principle is that Dr. Evil, who's sitting in the middle of our in the middle of our internet intercepting data, uh, can't read our encrypted data. And the way we're going to do this is we're going to modify our symmetric key scenario so that our private data is going to be encrypted with key one. We're going to use an algorithm that is publicly available. We're going to encrypt our data with key one and put it on the internet. And then using that same algorithm in reverse with key two, it, we're going to allow our recipient to be able to receive our, receive our original data. And in that way, the encrypted data uh, will be able to be moved throughout the internet. Now, the problem is, is that this hasn't actually solved our problem that we had with the symmetric key, which is how do we get key two to our recipient or key one to our sender? It's still a problem. So now what we're going to do with these keys is we're going to do something that's very social. Um, this is, a pro this is a, uh, something that we're going to do with the keys that isn't a technical um, feature of the keys. It's something that uh, we're going to use as a convention. And what we're going to do is we're going to use call one key our public key, and the other key is going to be our private key. And there's nothing special about them. Either key could be public or either key could be private. We can use them in either order. But in order to get the features that we're going to talk about next in order to work, we have to decide which one's going to be public and which one's going to be private. And once we've done that, we need to keep our private key secret. But our public key can be part of the open um, environment in which we share things. We're going to be able to give our public key to anyone we want and not worry about scrutiny of that key, whether a bad guy gets it or not. And we're going to keep our private key private. And that's going to enable us to do some interesting things. Um, anything that we encrypt with our public key only we are going to, anything that is encrypted with the public key, only we are going to be able to read with our private key. So this is how the scenario would work now. If you want to send something to Bob on the right, and you say Alice is on the left, what, what Alice does is Alice says to the recipient, Bob, say, Bob, can you give me the public key, please? Well, in fact, what Bob is going to do is Bob's just going to put the public key out on the public internet. It's going to be available for anyone who wants it, including the bad guys. 
And so the sender on the left has some data that they want encrypted. They're going to go get the public key and they're going to encrypt that data, that secret, with the public key and then send the encrypted data across the internet. Now what's interesting is we've taken one of our keys from our previous scenario, our previous graphic, and we've now made it the public key. When that encrypted data eventually gets to the recipient on the other side, the recipient is going to use the private key in order to unlock the data that was sent on the public internet. And because only the recipient has the public key, no one, even if they have the, no one uh, can decrypt that data unless they have the private key. Even if you have the public key, even if you know the algorithm, even if you have the encrypted data, it doesn't matter. You can't recover the original data unless you also have the private key. All right, so this is a graphical representation of that. Let's take a look at what, what it might look like if you wrote it down um, mathematically. All right. We're talking about asymmetric cryptographic keys. And the way this works is we'll have a function, which is an asymmetric encryption function. And as input, we're going to take our data, and we'll call it a message. And in addition to our message, we're going to take the key, the public key, of our recipient. And we're going to use that and our algorithm to encrypt this data and to create some encrypted data. The recipient is going to use the same function in the decryption mode. I'm sorry, it's the asymmetric key in the decryption mode is going to use as input the encrypted data and the private key. And what the recipient is going to be able to do is it's going to be the recipient is going to be able to recover that initial message. So this message is going to be the same as that one. The thing that's different about this from the symmetric key is that these two keys are different. They're asymmetric. But um, what, what, what was great about this is we didn't have to worry about getting the public key to the sender because the public key it's not really something that we need to keep secret. As part of the security by design principle we can let that go into the ecosystem. All right. So with this structure, this structure comes in handy in Bitcoin but it's a more general principle solution for different um, kinds of cryptographic assurances that you'd like to have. Um, with this principle we could do a kind of a secure communication between two people. What we've described here is we've described a way of sending a message from Alice to Bob. And then the way we do that is we're going to say, well, this isn't just any public key, it's Bob's public key. And this isn't just any private key, but it's Bob's private key. So that's great. That enabled Alice to send something to Bob. If Alice wants to have the encrypted communication back, there has to be a different pair of keys, and that's going to be Alice's private keys and public key pair. So if Bob wants to send to Alice, we'll use the same algorithm, asymmetric key algorithm. We're going to encrypt the new message, but we're going to encrypt it using Alice's public key. She's the recipient. We're going to get some new encrypted data and then when it arrives at Alice, Alice will use the asymmetric key algorithm that they've agreed on. She'll use it in the decrypt mode. As input, she'll use the message that was just sent to her, and she'll use her private key. And the result will be the message that Bob just sent to her, while the encrypted data and the public key was sent across the public internet. So in order to have an encrypted exchange back and forth, you need two pairs of public keys, Bob's public-private keys and Alice's public and private keys. So that's one thing that you can do with public-private keys. Another thing that's interesting that you can do with them is you can use them in the reverse way. And by using them in the reverse way, you can, um, you can declare that a message has actually come from a specific person and hasn't been tampered with. And the way you would do that is this. Now this isn't about secrecy, this is about ensuring that a certain person sent a message. So let's say Alice wants to send a message to Bob, and Bob wants to know that the message came from Alice and that the message wasn't tampered with. 
Well, what Alice can do is she can do the following. First of all, she has a message that she wants to send, and she's going to take a hash code fingerprint of that. So we'll use a hash function on the message in order to get the hash code for the message, the digital fingerprint. Then when Alice sends the message, this isn't about the secret data, so what she's going to do is she's going to send the message without encryption to Bob, but she's also going to sign that hash with her private key. So you, she'll use asymmetric encryption. She will encrypt the hash of the message using Alice's private key. And that will result in the encrypted hash, hash message, which will also be sent to Bob. So now what Bob can do when Bob receives this message and when Bob receives the encrypted hash message, he'll do two things. The first thing that he'll do is he'll decrypt this encrypted hash message using Alice's public key. Asymmetric decryption. We'll decrypt it using Alice's public key, which is publicly available, and we'll recover a hash message. Now, first of all, um, uh, we'll recover the hash message. The next thing that um, Bob is going to do is Bob is also going to try and calculate is also going to try and calculate the hash function of the message that he just received in the clear, and he's going to get some hash. Now. If these two things are equal, if they're equal, then we know two things. First of all, we know that the message must have come from Alice because it was signed with her private key and we were able to decrypt it using her public key. Secondly, we know that the message wasn't tampered with because when we calculated the hash function, we ended up with the same hash that Alice sent to us in this encrypted message. So asymmetric keys enable us to do several different things, and they're used in a lot of different ways. Uh, we can use them to send an encrypted message from one party to another over the internet. We can use them to send encrypted messages back and forth between two people. And we can use them to provide a digital signature for messages to ensure that the messages that were sent actually came from the person uh, who we think they were and that they weren't tampered along the way. Okay. This is as far as we're going to go in this class with the understanding of asymmetric keys. But if you're interested in knowing more about uh, how asymmetric keys are used, there's two interesting things that you can look at. One way that you could take this farther is you could look up the TLS protocol. That stands for Transport Layer Security, and that's the message by which secure websites are made secure. And the first step in that security process is a browser and a web server exchange, public, exchange a public key so that they can have um, an encrypted communication uh, following uh, throughout their session. It has a couple steps to it, but that's a place you can look further. The other question that you have to you have to figure out, and this is again advanced cryptography, is it's it's good to know that you were able to decrypt a message that came from Alice using Alice's public key or using your private key if she sent it to you. Um, but how do you know that Alice is the person who is in control of that key? How do you know that there's not someone who has um, who's pretending to be Alice and is sending you a message? You're using the public key, but that public key doesn't actually belong to Alice. It belongs to an imposter. The way that problem is solved is through a technology that you've probably seen in the internet as you go to different pages and get warnings of various kinds. But there's a kind of certificate that's used in order to validate that the person who claims to be Alice is Alice when they disclose their keys. That's one way of solving the problem. The other way of solving the problem is through something called a web of trust. So those are two advanced topics that you can look into more on your own if you're interested in knowing more about asymmetric cryptography. Knowing how public and private keys work are important for understanding the blockchain, and we'll talk about that more as we continue in the course. All right.
Thank you very much.